Well, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Welcome. Are y'all ready for the battlefields of life? This has been a great series. It's been out of the book of Mark, and it's been fun. Y'all clap so the people in Missouri City are awake, okay? (laughs) Welcome. I'm glad you're here. If you're at Elkins High School at the Missouri City campus, I'd like to welcome you. I want you to go by and say hi to Scott Denton. He's the lead pastor there in Missouri City. He'd love to get to know you and to shake your hand, and he'll put you to work. So you can avoid him if you need to. I want to welcome those watching online at riverpoint.tv. My mom is watching, and uh, she always watches. So welcome, Mom. I know it's snowing up there in western Maryland, so I'm glad you're here. Well, this is a busy time of the season for us, and I just want to give a couple commercials out before we get really started here. One is, a couple weeks ago, we handed out this Christmas CD on both campuses, and this was your invitation. We're not handing them out, but they're available on both campuses For you to get this. This is some of our great uh, favorite Christmas stuff that we've done here. And here's the deal. We put together a lot of effort, time, extra services starting first in December on the Richmond campus. We're going to five services. And on the Missouri City campus, we'll still have the two services. But they're going to be power packed. And uh, we're spending a lot of extra time and effort because here's the thing. If you don't go to church, the one time you do go to church is around Christmas time. So this is a huge time for us to really develop new relationships with people who we are really hoping that will come and discover a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's really up to you on both campuses to invite, to say, hey, I know you like great Christmas music and our pastor has promised to not speak as long. That's the promise. I promise. It's like 25 minutes at the most. 20, 25, 30, whatever. And I know, no, it's 20, 25. Seriously, they've really limited me. Because we're having on Richmond campus, we have three services on Sunday mornings now. And uh, we got to get jammed through this so I can't uh, ramble on like I'm doing now. So please get this. Go pick it up at the bookstore. It's free. And then give it to somebody and say, if you like good Christmas music, man, Come right after Thanksgiving. Be, be inviting people to do that. The other commercial I want to give is um, the Missouri City Campus has done really well. And in January, they celebrate three years of service there. They baptized 18 people in the Missouri City Campus last weekend. Way to go, guys. And we've been praying as a leadership team. We've been praying for the last nine months solid about starting a campus in Houston. I announced this last week, but I want to be redundant so that the word does get out. And we're starting in the, I was corrected. It's the Rice Military area of Houston. It's at Shepherd in Washington. You know where all those great bars are? Yeah, you do. And um, we want you to know about it so you can tell your friends that live in Houston. We have over 35 families that have a Houston address that want to be part of this new campus. So we have a great start, a good launch. We're having an uh, informational meeting on Thursday on the 20th at the Garland's house. They live in Houston, and they're kind of leading the way for us. So if you know of anybody, if you're interested in starting a Houston campus with me, I'm going to be doing it on Sunday evenings, I think, starting in 2015. I want you to get be a part of that. All right, so that's the end of the commercial time. All right, now we've got to get through this talk. We've been talking about in the book of Mark, and we've been talking about the different temptation, I mean, different battles that we have to face. We've talked about the battle of temptation. We talked about the battle of the mind. We talked about the battle of faith. And last week, if you weren't here, you got to get it. I loved it because it's so convicting for myself. It was the battle of self. We all took a selfie. Remember that? You know, we had this selfie, and we said, we got to get over ourselves. It's not about us. And it was really a challenge. I've heard so many great feedback, from, so much great feedback from the small groups that are meeting and talking about the sermon content. It's been awesome. So 
So please get that. Well, this week, we're talking about a battle that we've really got to be victorious in because it affects all the other areas of our life. It's the battle of money. Now, here's the thing about money that's a problem. Now, this isn't a sermon on giving, although we'll mention it just a little bit at the end. And I can feel everybody on both campuses already tightening up. You know, everybody's going, oh my gosh, here it comes. And uh, just the defensive nature of our conversations about money indicate how important money is to us. Money's a big part of our life, right? We have to have money. It stinks to be poor. There's no doubt about that. I mean, you're really at a disadvantage if you don't have enough resources to live or to eat or to get a, a proper education or, uh, or clothes. I mean, there, there's some real issues about money. So, But I, here's my goal of the talk today. It's, it's for us to have the proper perspective about money. Money is the thing that Jesus talked about and all the... Uh, uh, epistles uh, after the gospel accounts talked about more than any other one subject, more than heaven, more than hell. Money was talked about. I mean, count it up. I mean, go through it. It's amazing how many times money becomes the issue. And so that's the problem. Now, now listen, I know some of you here are, um, are, are have great resources and you're, and, you're, and you're rich. Okay, if you're, if you're in America, chances are Compared to a world standard, you're, you're rich, okay? You're richer than probably 97% of the people in the world. So congratulations. I know you don't feel that way because if you like, like me, I've got three children in college. I certainly don't feel that way. But compared to a world standard, we've got a lot of resources. So, so be careful. I, 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 what I want to tell you today, don't worry. I'm not going to tell you that being wealthy is wrong, okay? If you got wealthy and you got, you got a lot of... Uh, Great things like season tickets to the Rockets, you should get to know your pastor, stuff like that. I mean, so, I mean, I'm going to encourage you. I can't go to Texans games because they're on Sundays, uh, but uh, the Rockets are fun. <laughs> I don't like to hunt. The Rockets, if they're good seats, I am kind of a seat snob, sorry. <laughs> That's a little commercial for me. Anyway, so... Um, no, but, but here's the thing. It's not about how much money you have. Having a lot of money is not a problem. It's not a sin. Loving money is a sin, okay? And so it doesn't matter how much you have. That's what's so great about this teaching today. It applies to everybody. Everybody's guilty of losing the battle at some level of this battle of money. And we need victory because money, the pursuit of money, how we look at money, how we worship money is oftentimes the cause of so many other problems in our marriages and with our children and with, in life. I mean, really, we make some of the dumbest decisions of our life because we're chasing the almighty dollar. And we have to be careful. Here's why money is such a big deal in the Bible. And then we're going to get to a story in the book of Mark where a guy lost the battle in the, in the battle of money. He lost the battle completely. And I don't want us to do that. And here's why it's a big deal for God to talk about money so much. Money has a unique ability to take the place of God in our lives. It's something that we can pursue like we should be pursuing God. It's something that we can love like we should be loving God. It's something that we can depend on like we should be depending on God. It's the thing that we trust in. In, in other words, right now, what I'd guess uh, here in Richmond and both in, in Missouri City, I'd guess this. Most of us have a, a problem. We, we're dealing with the struggle. We have a challenge ahead of us. And whatever our challenge is, uh, there's a few exceptions to this, but mostly this is true. Whatever our challenge is, here's what I can say. We typically believe more money will help us solve the problem. Whether it will or not, I don't know. But we typically believe if I could just afford a little bit more of this... And that's the trap of money. It allows us to put our, our faith and hope in something that's inanimate. It becomes an idol. In fact, as Christians, here's what we do a lot. We ask God to give us more money. And God doesn't answer that prayer typically because he doesn't want money to replace him as the center point of your life. So we're going to talk about money. We're going to talk about the rich young ruler. Y'all familiar with this story? It's mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, three of the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels. And all three give it a little bit different perspective of it. We're told in the book of Luke that the guy we're talking about is a ruler. In other words, he had authority. He had probably a ring. He might have been on one of the religious councils. He was a young man. Everybody mentioned him as young. And so he had a deadly combination. He had power. He had money. And he had youth. 
I mean, money and youth never go well together, by the way. I mean, have you just remember when you thought it was a good idea to buy that stereo? You know, that kind of thing. You know, that kind of deal is what we're going to. So let's look at this story. And here's what we're looking for is how do we win the victory in the battle of money? Here's the first part of the story. As Jesus was setting out on his journey, a man ran up. So this is the, the excitement this man has. A man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, now here's the idea. I want you to catch this because this is a real story with real human beings, and it's the real struggle. I want you to place yourself in the, in the shoes of the rich young ruler because there's something about him you and I can identify with. This isn't just a Bible story that, that, that happened a long time ago. This is something you struggle with, this idea of money being overly important in our life. And here's what we see here. He had a lot of money. He was rich, but money somehow wasn't the answer for him. He still found emptiness. And what I love about this is that when he heard about Jesus, Jesus had just gotten through teaching about children, if you'll read in the book of Mark. He, and he was telling the disciples, let the little children come unto me. And he says, unless you come to God like one of these children, then you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, just sort of a total abandonment of total faith. He just really taught about that. And then this man runs up as he's going back to Jerusalem. Jesus is on his way back to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, we know he's going to give his life for the ransom for our sins. And on his way, this rich man ran up and knelt before him. Now, that was unusual. So it tells us something about this man's desperation. Now, I don't know about you, but I've, I've had money and been desperate too. Money doesn't solve our problems. Money doesn't make us happy. I've, I'm 50 years old now, and I've experienced that. I've, uh, I've had good times and bad times financially, and um, the idea is that none of those times, now when I am broke, it's a, little, it's a little tougher, I'll be honest with you, you know. There's a lot more anxiety and stress. I, I remember the first uh, uh, year we were starting River Point Church, and we didn't have a lot of support, and we were putting, um, we were putting the... Uh, expenses of the church on our American Express, hoping that the collection the next week would help us pay for the preschool equipment and all that. I mean, it was just hilarious. One night we were sitting at home. It was really late, and it was, it was winter time that first year. It was the first winter, and, um, and, and all of a sudden, I, out of the corner of my eye, I see this guy coming out of our backyard. So I'm going, why is that guy in our backyard? And just as I thought that, the lights went down. All the lights went off. <laughs> so I run out and I'm thinking, this guy stole my meter? What, what does this guy do? So I ran out and I go, hey, what are you doing? He goes, you didn't pay your bill. And we turned off your electricity. <laughs> Bummer. <laughs> He said, yeah, you're going to have to get that turned back on. And it's just, we were so like living hand to mouth. I mean, it was just like, oh, we didn't pay the electric bill. We couldn't pay that. We were paying the American Express off. And they came in the next day after a, a bigger fee and all that stuff. So I understand a little bit about what it means to have this deal. And I've had times in my life where I've had a, a, a good amount of money. You know, the church is really taking care of us. And I live in a nice house with a pool and all that stuff. But here's the idea. This man in this story had tons of money, and he still recognized this. This is the battle cry for this battle in the battle of money. Here's the battle cry. Something's missing. Now, here's the idea. This is the battle cry because this is a call to arms for you. This is the idea that when something's missing in our life, we typically believe that the something is missing is more money. What I'm missing is some cash, you know. What I'm missing is a bonus. What I'm missing is a good-paying job. What I'm missing is, 
uh, the, the, com- the compensation I'm deserved, or whatever it is, something's missing. This man, who was rich and authority and young, recognized in his early life that something was missing, and he ran and he knelt before Jesus. So at least he went to the right place, right? Here's a man from God. So he recognized that the material part of his life was pretty much together, but inside the spiritual part of his life, there was something desperately wrong. Now, I want you to kind of think about that for just a minute, because many of you, you have this anxiety in your life, and you have this hole in your heart, and you're thinking something's wrong, and you're trying to figure out what it is. Do like this rich young ruler did, and run to Christ and ask the question that he's about to ask, okay? So that's the deal. What am I supposed to do with eternal life? How am I get eternal life? So run to the right source. That's a good thing. But recognize, like this man didn't recognize, that, um, that there's something spiritual in your life, and recognize that money is not going to fulfill all your needs. And then go, let's go on to the story. It says this. Something's missing, and he says... Jesus says, the question was, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And so Jesus kind of gives a funny answer. He says, do you know the commandments? Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear, uh, bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Now, that's interesting that when Jesus quoted the Ten Commandments, there's only six here. And he didn't quote the first four. These are the last six. This first four, let's see if I can get my seminary right. Is uh, don't have any other God before me. Don't have any idols. Uh, Don't take the Lord's name in vain. And keep the Sabbath holy. So the way you think about the Ten Commandments is the first four of the Ten Commandments deal with your relationship with God. And the next six commandments deal with your relationship with others. And you can see those here. Don't commit murder. That'd be a bummer. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Don't defraud. Honor your father and mother. Those six on the ten are dealing with your relationship with other people. It's interesting that Jesus did not mention the first four. He says, you know the commandments, and he only lists six. Now, you think the man, if he was sharp, and he was religious sharp. He was a Jewish ruler. He understood the commandments. He knew the Ten Commandments. He knew the Bible very well. Everybody, every scholar I read about this story understood that. And then, here's what Jesus said. And he said to him, uh, sorry, the man said to Jesus, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. Liar. This guy... Here's what he says. He says, all, he said to the teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. Now, here's what Mark does for us. Mark, in this, in this uh, scripture, gives us insight into the man's thought life of his, the way he thought about himself. This is also the way we think of ourselves. So there's something missing in this man's life, even though he's very wealthy and he has authority. And he's young. He's got everything going for him. And he's not, something's missing spiritually, so he runs to Jesus, and he says to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus turns it on him and says, well, okay, here, here's what Jesus does, because I have an understanding that Jesus is God, and he knew the thoughts of this man, and he knew that this man was a pretty moral guy. He kept the rules. He was a devout Jew. And so Jesus only lists the first, uh, the last six commandments, leaving out the first four, and he says, I know this man's going to think he did all these. Now, here's the insight. Here, here, here's the, the real fight. It's religion over relationship. That's the man's problem, is he had religion over a relationship. This is why, folks, listen, this is why in this battle, when we feel like something's missing, we say oftentimes, well, I'm doing all the right things. I'm going to church. I'm giving a little change. I'm volunteering over here to help the poor. I'm praying, reading my Bible. I'm doing all the right things, but there's still something missing. I don't know if you felt that way spiritually, but here's the deal. This man was trusting in his religion over a relationship with Christ. Or, or with God. I mean, the relationship with Yahweh was not as important as the, as the religion, as the ceremony, as the food he was eating, as the worship times he went to, as the, as the festivals he kept, and the laws he think he thought he had. Now, here's one thing that I, I don't know this for sure, but I, here's what I felt, felt like the guy was saying. When Jesus said, you know these six commandments, 
the man said, well, I've kept these from my youth. Here's what I think the guy was really saying. Now, again, I don't, I don't know this to be true, but I, I think because I know people, here's what I think he was saying. He was saying, I have known these things, these truths, since I was a youth. I've been going to church my whole life. I know this truth. And what Jesus was trying to surface for the guy is the difference between knowledge of truth and the assimilation of truth. Because I can tell people all the time, I tell them all the time about Jesus, that Jesus died on the cross for their sins. And here's what I say. Listen, here's what I say to them. I say, so here's the problem. You and I have this sin problem. It's created this gap between you and me and God because God's holy and you're not holy. And so every other religion of the world is about man being good enough or being reincarnated or something to bridge the gap between sinful man and God. But Christianity is the only religion in the world where God so loved the world that he sent his son to die for our sins. And the cross bridges that gap. So we get to have this relationship with Christ because of Jesus. And so I'm explaining this to people all the time. It's kind of my job. Okay, you got that? So I'm explaining that. And I say, so there's got to be a point in your life where you recognize, first of all, you need a Savior. There's got to be a point in your life where you have a conversion, where you accept this truth for you. And time after time after time, it happened this week. I tell the story, the good news, that Jesus died for your sins. He was buried and he rose again. And here's what people say all the time. I've believed that my whole life. That's what they say. I believe that my whole life. And you got to be careful about that. Because that's what this guy was saying. You know, honor your father and mother. Don't commit murder. Jesus, I've kept those since my youth. I've believed that my whole life. And he's asking the right question. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And when Jesus gives him this answer, he, know wasn't, he knew it wasn't true. The man said, well, I believed that truth all my life. So if you were raised in North America and you had any church background and you've heard the story of Jesus, you've got to be careful about this idea of you believing the historical facts about Jesus as a conversion. I said that last week, if you're not really careful, what that will make you is historically accurate, but it won't make you regenerated, it won't make you saved, it won't give you forgiveness. So if your answer to, oh, I believe that all my life, you need to question what's going on. You have to come to a place in your life where you believe it for you. And it moves from head understanding this intellectual approach to this heartfelt understanding and need. And that's what this man's problem was. He was trusting in his religion and he had no relationship with God. Well, here's what Jesus did then. Here's where we get to the money part. Are y'all still with me? How about you, Missouri City? Because I feel like I lost somebody along the way. It's like people are leaving here. Okay. And Jesus, I love this. This is like my favorite part of the whole passage. Jesus looked at him, looking at him loved him. Only Mark gives us that insight. Matthew and Luke don't give us that insight. Jesus loved this guy who was confused about his religion. He loved him. And he said to him, well, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Whoa. It's a rich young ruler, right? I mean, I think if I was a rich young ruler, I'd say, no, just give me the other four commandments. I'll try that, okay? It's like, you know, come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And that was it. Here's the battlefront right here. What are you trusting in? The battlefront is... What are you trusting in? If the answer you have for your problem is more money, that's what you're trusting in. I mean, really. I know. I know you want more money. I know you need more money. I know you deserve more money. I want more money. Heck, my wife went to the Nutcracker Market this weekend. I need a lot of money. 
I got all this on sale. <laughs> I act like I value what she values, guys. It's a great marriage tip. Just great. And then here's what you say if you've been married as long as I have. Show me everything you got. Show me every. I want to see it all. Every Yes, I want to see it. Put it out there. I want to see every, hours of you looking at your stuff. That's what I want to see. <laughs> Nutcracker market. Beautiful. She went three times this weekend. <laughs> She's serious about this thing. You know, it's, so I get this thing about money. He's not talking about money. He understood. Jesus uniquely understood that this man was trusting in his money. And here's the deal. The cost of following Christ, listen to me, was too high. It's too expensive. See, and, and listen, find yourself in this story. Be, 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 don't, don't sit there and act all pious. Don't, don't sit down there at Elkins High School and act like you got it all together. Because we quit following Christ when the cost gets too high. I'd do anything for you, God. Oh, yeah? Okay, I won't do that. But anything else. It's that meatloaf song, you know, I'd do anything for love, but I won't do that. That's the deal. I want you to look at the contrast. This guy says, he runs up. He kneels down. He says, in all humility, what a posture. This, uh, now, this in the first century, this is a big deal. There's no way we can. It'd be, like the, it'd be like the governor running up to me, kneeling down and say, Pastor, tell me what, what I must do to be saved. You know, it's that kind of deal. It's like, like, uh, that's the idea. So he runs up with all this enthusiasm. What must I do to be saved? There's something missing in my life. And, and he says, well, are you a moral person? Oh, I am a moral person. I've kept all those rules and regulations. I've done the very best I can. I've been very devout. I know my Bible. I'm religious. And there's still, there's something missing. And Jesus really inadvertently is saying this thing. The thing that's missing is me. It's not the things about me. It's not the religion around me. It's me, this person, this person, Jesus. And this person, Jesus, wants to invade your soul and lead your life and be the center of your world. And here's the truth. If you don't fight this battle about money, money will be everything that Jesus wants to be in your life. And this man didn't get it. And he recognized all the comforts in the first century. Man, if you had money, you had it made. You had servants. You had people carrying you from here to there. You had a big house. You had plenty of food, which in the first century was a pretty big deal. I mean, you had it made. And so what Jesus was asking him to do is take the comforts and the, and the, and the great things he had in this life and exchange those things for something eternal, something significant, something that would fill in the gap in his life, this relationship with him. And he, listen, this is where you live, he was not willing to let go of his comfortable life in order to follow Christ. And at some level, you're not either, nor am I. Because we talk a good game. We talk about, we, we'd rather talk about how devout we are and how we're keeping all the rules. And Jesus says, no, I want you to completely and totally trust in me. Not your money, not your job, not your education. That's all part of the picture. But the center part of the picture is me. I want you to focus on me, not your income, not your money. Now listen, I say this because I'm an ambitious person. Your desire to make more money is not a problem until it replaces God as the center of your life. You wanting to become more valuable to your company so they compensate you better, it's not a problem. It's not a bad. You, you being a shrewd business person is not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Make as much money as you can. Just don't fall in love with it. Keep a loose grip on it. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew. I love this. He says in Matthew 6, 19, he says, 
Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. In other words, where there's temporariness. And where thieves break in and steal. You ever been robbed? Okay. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Then give us more definition. Where neither moth or rust destroys. And where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We're going to memorize that right here. Starting with four. Y'all with me? This is a truth. This is not a question. This isn't a suggestion. This isn't kind of so. This is tr completely and totally true. So you need to say it out loud together. Both campuses. Here we go. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Without a doubt. So look. You want to know where your heart really is? Look at where your treasure is. That's it. This isn't kind of true. This is true. You look at where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. I mean, that's the conviction of this thing. Then he goes on to say in Matthew chapter 6, listen, this even gets harder. He says, no one can serve two masters. That's clear. And here's how he uses money. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot do it. You have to choose. This is the battlefront. You have to choose what you're going to trust in. You cannot serve both God and money. You just can't do it. And then later in chapter 6, and I think it's around 33, he says this. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, speaking of the material things you need in life, will be added to you. But the priority is seek first the kingdom of God. This is the battlefront. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where we've got to get a grip as followers of Christ. Listen, we cannot adopt the practices, financial practices of this culture. It will ruin us. You just can't do it. That's why we offer every January. I want you to decide right now. Financial Peace University. We offered on the Richmond campus last semester, last year. I think Jack Brady, uh, who's uh, got a lot of financial knowledge and mentors young couples in finances. Man, he taught that. It was great. I don't know who's teaching it this year. But, but he might, But if he hears this sermon, he could hear it. Hey, Jack. And um, he was great. Okay, so I don't know who's teaching it this year. But, but you need to take that class in January. We're about to rev up in, into the holiday season, a very expensive time for everybody. So you cannot adopt the culture's practices on the world. So I wrote down a couple of things that I think that you can do that, that will help you win this battle on the money. And I'll be done with this because I know everybody's tired of talking about it. I can tell. It was so much easier talking about the other stuff. Here we go. First thing. This is genius, by the way. I thought of this myself. I've never heard this before. I was just praying and fasting, and this came to me. It's a powerful thing. Let's say it out loud together. Ready? Live within your means. It's genius. That means spend less money than you make, regardless of how much money you make. There's some statistic out there that says the average American spends 105% of their income every year. 105%. I'm not good at math, but anything over 100% seems to be eventually going to be a problem. Don't tell our government that, but <laughs> for you it's a problem. You know, maybe you can print more money, but that's illegal. So, Live within your means. Here's what that means. That means you need to have, again, this is genius, a budget. Yeah, it's big. A budget. Regardless of how much money you have. You may have so much stinking money that you'd never run out. Have a plan on spending that money. That's a budget. I mean, if you have that much money and you think, well, I don't need a budget and get whatever I want. I don't need. Have a budget. Live within, create some boundaries. A budget is a boundary 
And you create that boundary, and you say, I'm going to live within this boundary. Now, you can adjust the budget. There's nothing sacred about the budget. It's a plan, and plans change. So you got to have a budget. Most people who have money budget. The people who don't budget are the young couples I talk to. They don't have a budget. And they say, well, we don't have any money, so why budget? I said, maybe you don't have any money because you don't budget. I don't know. <laughs> I'm thinking. But then I sound like a parent, and I quit talking. So, so that's the deal. you got to budget regardless. If you have no money, you should budget. You should teach your teenagers when they get a job how to do a budget. Now, there's a difference. We had this fight for a long time. My wife and I keeps the, my wife keeps the books in our family. And so uh, we fought. There's a difference between budgeting and accounting. Accounting is you can say, I know where every dime of my money goes. That's accounting. That's, that's good. Congratulations. A budget, on the other hand, though, is something that you have that says, this is how much money we're going to spend on these things. And when we reach our budget, we're going to stop spending. It's a stop. It's a boundary. It's a red flag. Y'all follow me? Okay. So you've got to have a budget. That's your goal for 2015. So spend as much as you want in the next six weeks. But after that, <laughs> no, don't do that. It's terrible advice. But uh, have a budget. This is what you're going to need. You're going to need to know how much money you're going to... You know where we spend the most money in our family still is food. When our kids were in the house, it, um, uh, it's dispersed differently now. Now it's called education, but it's still food. And, uh, you know, we're spending about $800 to $1,000 a month in food. Well, I have three boys, and they have a lot of friends. And then when we go out to eat, you know... So we had a policy in our family. Here's one of the things. No soft drinks. You know? No soft drinks. Soft drinks are like two bucks. Right? So we had six people. Twelve dollars of our bill. I know I'm sounding cheap right now. But twelve dollars of bill was just drinks. So, of course, now when, uh, when the kids are gone, me and Lisa are getting that Dr. Pepper, man. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it's only four bucks now. <laughs> anyway. So, anyway. The budget is really important. Listen, if you do not have a budget, it is a disaster. Look, here, I'm going I'm to say something mean. Don't ask God to help you financially if you're not going to have a budget. Don't do it. Because he's going to say, well, get a budget. Get a plan. Count the cost. It's a biblical idea. Figure it out. Don't ask God to, oh, God, just bless me with more money. No, I'm not. That's what he's going to say. I will not do it. Get a budget. You heard Patrick. Get a budget. That's what God's going to say to you. Put together a piece. But there's budgeting software. Get with somebody to help you. Come on. How much money should you be spending on this? And here's the deal. When you get a budget, you recognize you're going to have to make some changes in your life, which is why we don't want a budget. Because we can't go out. In other words, when you are living within your means, here's the thing. You've got to be able to say no. And we don't like saying no. You want to go out to eat? Let me check the budget. No. Hey, should we buy this? Let me check the budget. No. We have this Messiah complex that says, I just want to do whatever I want to do whenever I want to do it. And if I can't afford it, I'm going to charge it. We'll just pay it off. It's not how much is it. It's how much is it a month. That's what the deal is. <laughs> That's what we're going to get. Because I want it. And then here's what the devil does. I deserve it. I deserve this. And you just, I'm telling you, I've made every one of these mistakes. And so get a budget, live within your means, and say no. Here's another practice that's going to help you win the battle on money. Be generous. Most people say, I can't afford to be generous. When I get all, here's the thought. You never say this because it sounds so selfish, but I've heard it. I've said it. When I take care of me, when I get all the things I need, then I'm going to help out other people. That is, you'll never get to the end of you, by the way. You're a black hole of need, okay? <laughs> it's like, well, when I get everything I need, then I'm going to be generous. I'm going to help out on that thing. I'm going to help that person. I'm going to get that. And then you just never get, you wonder why years, decades go by and you've never stepped up and helped somebody in need. You've known they're in need, but you don't help them because you're not, you're not through meeting your needs yet. That is the ploy of the devil. I'm telling you, it'll ruin you. 
You've got to be a generous person. It means be generous. It's just, don't be crazy or foolish. I'm not saying that. Be generous. What can I do to help? That's the question. Gets the idea off yourself. Here's, here's an, uh, the third thing, and this is the hard thing. You think this is self-serving, but it's really not. Move toward being a biblical giver. Giving is the only, only antidote to being consumed by the love of money. Giving is it. That's it. Because when we give money away, we, it's hard to worship it. Because when you give money away, you're saying, you know what I could be doing with this money? A biblical giver is a person who gives a percentage of their income on a regular basis with a cheerful heart. Cheerful heart's the hard part. <laughs> now, we, what we believe and what we say at River Point is take a step forward. Move, that's why I say move toward being a biblical giver. It means if you're giving zero, give something. Your goal this year is to give a dollar. There, you've done it. You wouldn't believe the majority of people at River Point give zero. I mean, not even like a dollar. So give a dollar. If you're given something, then, then what happens is you give when you're here. Whatever's in your pocket, you give, okay? <clears throat> Move towards giving whether you're here or not. In other words, in your budget, you have this line that says giving. And you're going to give that amount of money regardless of whether you're here or not. Maybe you sign up for online giving. That's how our family gives. Maybe you just say, whether I'm here, I'm going to mail in the check. But I'm going to give. And if you're already doing that and you say, okay, I want to move toward a biblical giver, then I'm going to give a percentage of my income. Now, this is scary. Because if you start with 2 3 4% and you put that on an annualized basis, that's a lot of money. And you go, you know what I could be doing with that money? That's almost like a car or a boat or a trip or beer or something. You know, I mean, that's, that's you, you materialize that into something for yourself. And then you give that percentage, but that's, and then the biblical giving, give a tithe. Move toward giving 10%. Can you imagine what, I know, I see it in your eyes. I can see it all the way in Missouri City. You've already done the math. You know what 10% of your annual income is? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Listen, this is why it's for you and not for me in terms of being the pastor of the church. This is the only antidote to being consumed with the love of money. The stuff you're giving away, you value. Look at the garage sale stuff. One time you thought that was incredible and you had to have it, and next it's a quarter on a table in your garage. <laughs> Am I right? I've had those garage sales. And at the end of that deal, they'll say, how much? We'll say, how much do you want to take it? Because I will pay you to take it. Just take it away. See, now what we're saying is, if you'll give, give your money away, be a faithful giver. Now listen, I'll say this because this helps me and helps you. If, you. if you feel like I'm just trying to get in your pocket because you're defensive and wanting to support something here, get, give, it to, uh, give it to Young Life. Give it to FCA. Give it to Attack Poverty. There's a fellow right over here in the Richmond campus that, that is a missionary in Africa. Give it to that guy. See, it's, it's not about... Where you give it. Give it to God's work somewhere. I want you to give it to River Point because I believe in this mission. But, but if, it, if you're saying, well, he's just saying that to raise the budget. No, I really am not. I'm saying that to raise the maturity level of people that are losing the battle of money. Week after week and month after month. And you can either, you either trust me or you don't. See, here's the, here's the pushback on this war, this battle of the money, is this is going to create change in you. Your faith is going to, when you start writing that check and you start giving your money away and you start being generous to people and you start living within your means, you can't live the way you're living. And let me tell you, this is a little insight from a pastor about Jesus' agenda for you. It's change. It's maturity. It's growth. And the only way you're going to grow is to stop being the way you are and be a different way. So there's these things that God's put into place. They're catalysts for change, and one of them is the way we deal with money. 
And if you can just let go of something so you can grab a hold of God, then all of a sudden your faith explodes and God becomes the center. And when you have trouble, the first thought in your mind's not, we need more money, we're broke, we can't afford that. The first thing in your mind is, we need God. Oh, God's got to come through. We need to pray. It's a completely different way to live life. You see, when the cost of following Christ gets too high, you'll stop following him. That's what happened to this man. He went away sad because he wasn't willing to let go of the temporary things in order to grab a hold of that one thing that would satisfy his soul, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He just wasn't willing to do it. I mean... And here's the thing. I'll tell you this. I, I, I believe this. This is the only time in Scripture where we see it, where a man's asked to give everything he has. But we've seen other people do it, all the apostles and disciples. In fact, the next paragraph, the, Peter's going, hey, we gave up everything. Are we good with you? I mean, is this good? Is this good? I mean, because, like, we walked away from our jobs and families and houses and income and everything. Is this what you're talking about? And Jesus said, yeah, this is exactly what I'm talking about. This is the only time in Scripture I can see where Jesus is saying, you, hey, you, give up everything you got, all your financial well-being, and come follow me. So I don't believe Jesus is probably asking you to sell everything you have and give it to his work and start with zero. So, God, here's what I, I do believe he's asking you. Move money out of the center of your life and stop loving it like it's going to satisfy you because it will not. And move Jesus to the center of your life. And the way you do that is you live within your means, you're generous, and you start becoming a giver. And all of a sudden, life is different. Contentment, peace, joy. You'll stress less about money when you start giving it away. I, pro I don't know why that works. And I don't believe if you give, then God's going to give you a hundred times more. I believe if you give, God's going to take care of every need you have. I believe also if you don't give, God's going to take care of every need you have. But you'll get more out of it if you become a giver. So go home and talk to your spouse or go home and look at your budget or go home and say what it is. It's not about the amount of money. It's this idea of of giving. And I want to win this battle of money. We are a money craved world, man. It's all about the money. Show me the money. It's a money grab out there. And I just don't want to live that way. I hope you don't either. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for loving us enough, like you love this man, to challenge us to replace ourselves and money at the center of our lives and put you at the center of our lives. And I know as I talked, even today, again, on both campuses, people recognize that they are historically accurate when it comes to you, but they've never given their life to you. And if that's you and you're praying, I don't want you to leave today without the opportunity to give your life to Christ, to change this historical understanding into a real relationship. And as you pray, all you got to do on both campuses is pray this God, I believe for me. I am convicted that I am in need of forgiveness. And I believe my only hope is that Jesus died on the cross for me. And he was buried and he rose again and he paid totally and completely for my past, present, and future sins. And I believe that for me. That prayer, sincerely in your heart, is the beginning of a relationship. And God, I want to follow you. I don't want to worship money. I don't want to chase money. I don't even want to stress out about money. I want to be, do what Matthew said, and that is seek you first in your kingdom, in your righteousness. And I pray, God, that you would indeed uh, teach us how to worship you in spirit and truth and how to let um, you, Lord, our world, lead our life have authority and not let money rob us. So um, what must we do to have eternal life? We know it's to have you. And I pray we would. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I know